Los Angeles, California. He's affiliated with Cedar sinai Medical Center and is an assistant clinical professor of medicine for the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. Dr. Hilegwa is also a member of SA's Board of Directors and previously served as our board chair for four years. Dr. Hilegwa, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Melissa. As Melissa said, my name is Dr. David Legua. I uh, am a full-time rheumatologist and also a board member of the Spondylitis Association of America. Today we're going to talk about ankylosing spondylitis and the related diseases as well as uh, um, the medications that are used to treat these illnesses with special em emphasis on their benefits as well as risks. Okay, it takes a little while to change. Are we on the next slide, Melissa? We are. Okay. Um, the spondyl arthropathies are a group of uh, illnesses that have a lot in common. They share clinical manifestations, which includes symptoms and signs. The genetics do cross over as well. One common gene that we all know about that is shared by people with spondylitis is the HYB27 gene. Disease complications are also shared across these illnesses. There are unique disease-causing mechanisms that can be treated with specific drugs, and we'll go over those mechanisms briefly. The severity of the illness can also vary widely among affected individuals, and treatment has to be tailored according to the severity of the illness in each individual. Just to name the uh, different related illnesses, as you can see in this Venn diagram, the uh, ankle group of illnesses in this category includes ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, arthritis is with, associated with inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease or arthritic colitis, juvenile spondyloarthritis, undifferentiated spondyloarthritis, reactive arthritis, and acute anterior uveitis. These different entities could exist alone without ankylosing spondylitis, but as you can see, these entities can also overlap with it. For example, you could have a person with ankylosing spondylitis where the spine stiffens up and fuses who also has Crohn's disease, or somebody with AS who also has psoriasis. So these diseases really overlap and are really a family of illnesses. Well, I promised you we would go over briefly the disease mechanisms in AS and related illnesses. There's a considerable body of evidence that points to inflammation as a cause for a lot of the symptoms. We do know that the inflammatory blood tests, such as the sedimentation rate and the C-reactive protein, are elevated in the proportion of patients. We do know that anti-inflammatory medications work for at least 50% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis and the related illnesses. We also do know that the immune drugs, which are the TNF inhibitors, also down-regulate uh, inflammation are effective in treating it. Inflammation mediated through tumor necrosis factor, or TNF, and other cytokines, which are um, disease-causing immune-mediated uh, substances in the body lead to activation of bone remodeling cells, also known as osteoclasts, which can cause erosions in the bone, particularly in the peripheral joints, not in the spine, in patients with psoriatic arthritis as well as in reactive arthritis. It also leads to bone loss and osteoporosis where you're uh, at higher risk of fractures. A unique feature, though, in this, Ill, uh, in this disease is new bone formation that can lead to fusion of joints in the fingers or the toes. It can also lead to calcification of ligaments in the spine and give you a bamboo spine. We'll see a picture of that shortly. There is a protein in the body called a DKK protein, which is an inhibitor, or in other words, it shuts off a pathway called the Wnt pathway 
in the bone forming cells of the body. These bone forming cells or osteoblasts are found in the bone and there is evidence that this pathway is upregulated or overactive in ankylosing spondylitis and the DKK protein even though it's elevated trying to shut off this pathway is not able to do it. This result, research is in the preliminary stages and we do not have anything that uh, blocks the pathway yet and we do not know whether blocking this pathway will be fruitful um, in decreasing bone formation. Going over a few other important, uh, uh, important aspects of the immune system that, are, uh, that we should understand uh, that result, results in disease causation. When we look at the immune system, we have cells called T cells, which are an integral part of the cell mediated immunity of the body. The other part of the uh, immune system is the antibody producing cells or the B cells. These naive T cells will differentiate into different pathways depending on the milieu in which it is being activated. So if there's a self antigen, which could be a cell uh, with surface antigens like a bowel cell or a cell in a joint perhaps that is presented to a CT cell in the presence of an inhibitory cytokine called TGF beta, then the T cell differentiates into a regulatory cell called T regulatory cell expressing a, a unique gene product called FOXP3 and this results in protection against autoimmune illnesses. There is ample evidence that this pathway is dysregulated in a number of autoimmune cell, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and perhaps ASM related illnesses as well. On the other hand, if there is inflammation due to an infection perhaps, due to other uh, causes for inflammation, and a cytokine called interleukin-6 is present, and a self antigen is there along with TGF beta, this results in autoreactive cells, so-called Th17 cells, which produces cytokines that create inflammation and uh, cell damage to the cells of the body. Basically a loss of the ability to, to recognize oneself. And this is the pathway that we talked about a little bit earlier where cytokines such as tumor necrosis factor that are secreted by activated uh, immune cells like macrophage and, and uh, T cells, they activate the, cell, uh, the cells in the bone marrow called osteoclasts, which can break down bone and create erosion and also thin the bone and create osteoporosis. Moving along to which organ can be affected in spondyloarthritis, Peripheral arthritis can affect the bones and uh, joints in the hands, in the knees, uh, in the hips. Spinal involvement affects mainly the ligaments that bind the vertebrae together. The ligaments and tendons that are inserted into the bone can also be involved. Um, skin and mucous membranes can be involved as well. We'll see some slides of psoriasis as well as you know, mucous membrane involvement. Gastrointestinal involvement refers to the inflammation that occurs in inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. In ankylosing spondylitis as well, up to 50% of patients can have an asymptomatic inflammation present in the bowel that can be found on a biopsy. Uh, cardiovascular and pulmonary manifestations are late manifestations that occur 10 to 20 years into the, um, uh, after the onset of the illness and result in a leaky valve uh, in the aortic area as well as an aneurysmal change in the aorta as well. With respect to the lung, there is fibrosis that occurs in the apex of the lung the lung function in terms of expanding and contracting can also be inhibited in ankylosing spondylitis due to the restrictive effects of this illness on the rib cage. 
in order to understand how different drugs uh, work and how we can determine that they work, we need to have a basic understanding of the assessment tools that have been developed in ankylosing spondylitis. The first on that list is the BAS dye. The BAS dye is uh, an acronym for the BAS Ankylosing Spondylitis Disease Activity Index, and it is a questionnaire formed of six questions. Four questions ask a patient to uh, quantify their fatigue, their pain in their neck, back and hip, pain in, in other joints, and uh, tenderness to touch or pressure. And the last two questions ask questions about stiffness, particularly morning stiffness, with respect to the duration and severity, and you get a composite score of this. The BAS knee refers to a questionnaire and uh, measurement tools that are used to see if, if the movement uh, improves the treatment. The ASA is 20, 40, 50, and 70, called the assessment NEA, is a composite or a group of measures that are put together to see if a person improves by 20%, 40%, or 50%. And the, the domains looked at are patient global assessment of their disease, back pain, inflammation, and function. ASA is 5 uh, over 6 add spinal mobility and C-reactive protein, which is a uh, measure of inflammation to it. And you have to improve in five out of six of these measurements to say that the person is, um, has uh, reached that endpoint. The ASAS 40 improvement is the recommended criteria for evaluating disease-modifying agents. So what are the axial signs and symptoms that we look for with medications that treat AS? Well, we look at uh, pain in the spine. We look at mobility in the spine. And here's a patient that has restricted mobility due to AS affecting the spine. And when we look at x-rays to see if x-rays have improved with uh, a treatment in AS, we look at preventing these changes which is uh, a, an x-ray here that shows the bamboo spine changes, basically vertebra that have ligaments that run across them that have become calcified or have had bone formation in that area. So you can see that it becomes a continuous uh, calcified ligament going all the way down the spine. And this is uh, referred to as a bamboo spine appearance. You can see on this side a more normal spine where there is space between the vertebra, which is normal. But this, so these vertebra have become kind of square in shape due to inflammation at the corners of the vertebra that makes it lose its characteristic biconcave shape. This is another manifestation due to inflammation of ligaments, ligaments that attach to the joints in a toe or a finger can get swollen, giving a sausage visit appearance, also known as dactylitis. And tendon inflammation sites can uh, be inflamed. This is a, a slide that shows an Achilles tendon that is attached to the heel of this patient that has become inflamed and swollen. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about agents that can be used to treat this condition as well. When you look at a, a treatment guideline for spondyloarthritis, a person can present with axial or spine disease alone. They can present with peripheral arthritis in the fingers or the hip or the knee alone. They can present with one of these with psoriasis. Um, or alternatively, they can present with colitis or uveitis, which is inflammation of the eye. You can see various combinations and depending on the combination, you should tailor the treatment um, to uh, improve uh, all the manifestations of the illness. So the initial treatment is considered to be uh, to compose of NSAIDs and uh, disease-modifying drugs, particularly the synovitis or joint damage. If you have a good response to these treatments, then you uh, monitor them. If you do not have a good response, then you move on to the next 
category of drugs used, which are disease-modifying drugs, and they are sulfasalazine, lefunilamide, methotrexate, and cyclosporin. If you have a good response there, you monitor again. It should be noted that these drugs that are listed here have efficacy only in peripheral spondyloarthritis and do not treat axial disease at all, whereas NSAIDs can help in both axial disease as well as peripheral spondyloarthritis. However, some considerations that should be taken into account with NSAIDs is that if you have colitis present where you have inflammation of the uh, bowel resulting in diarrhea and abdominal pain, NSAIDs are contraindicated. If you fail these DMARDs and you have active disease, uh, right. suggestive of three uh, tender joints and three swollen joints, one should consider treatment with tumor necrosis blocking okay, drugs. Where did you find that? We'll talk about those. If you have a good response to that, then you monitor. If you fail a TNF blocker, you can switch to another one. NSAIDs are the consequence of uh, yeah. treatment for uh, Maybe? spondyloarthritis. Uh, there are many NSAIDs that have FDA approval for ankylosing spondylitis. The uh, yeah. NSAIDs include yeah. diclofenac, ibuprofen, naproxen, indomethacin, enterocoded aspirin, and solindac. They are effective in reducing pain and uh, stiffness adequately, which is uh, at least 50%, in about half of the AS patients treated. But they are limited by uh, stomach toxicity and uh, lack of loss of efficacy over time. So this is a fairly long-term trial of almost a year um, in a patient with AS. And as you can see, placebo treatment patients drop off very early in, 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 uh, when you treat AS patients because of uh, no efficacy. But the NSAIDs also um, drop off over time, and you can see a 20 to 25 percent of patients over a year have dropped out because of loss of efficacy and sometimes toxicity. Pyroxicam is Feldine, Meloxicam is Mobic. Both uh, agents well, are approved for AS. Yeah. I do hear a little disturbance. Dr. Vilekwa, can you just yeah. pause for a minute? I'm not sure why we're getting, we're able to hear somebody else right now because everybody is muted. Um, okay. I shall pause. Uh, we're going to try to resolve this because according to all of my indications, everybody's muted. It's an automatic thing. So um, we're going to try to get on the phone and try to clear it up. But um, go ahead and continue on, and then we'll okay. work it out. One question that has often been asked is, do NSAIDs modify disease progression, meaning does it reduce inflammation enough where bone fusion, which is what we often are trying to prevent in, in uh, patients with ankylosing spondylitis, uh, does that occur? So this was the trial done in France in over 200 patients with ankylosing spondylitis. They were divided into two groups, and one group was given Celebrex or Celecoxib, 200 milligrams twice a day continuously, and another group was given Celebrex and was told to take it, take it whenever you need it, but you don't have to take it regularly. And they looked at the X-ray changes, basically for fusion, that I showed you earlier. And there's a, a spine score that's available called the Stokes Ankylosing Spondylitis Spine Score, which was used to assess for bone fusion. At two years, they looked at 76 patients as a leftover from the over 100 patients that started the therapy who were on continuous Celebrex treatment, the C group, to the 74 patients that were left over that were on Celebrex on demand or the OD patients. It's going to take some work. The, uh, when we looked at the uh, progression, there was a significant difference between the group that took the Celebrex continuously, they had a uh, progression of only 0 
on this uh, SAFS as score, whereas in the on-demand group, the amount of progression was 1.5, and this was statistically significant. But this is just one study that shows that maybe NSAIDs uh, can be uh, disease modifying. More studies need to be done before we can conclude anything from it. One thing to take away from the study is that nighttime use of NSAIDs is probably the most important because it's at nighttime that a majority of the inflammation appears to occur in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. That doesn't mean that inflammation does not occur during the day, but they think that the authors of the study believe that it was the nighttime dose that gave a I'll difference. Go, I'll go now. So these are the GI side effects that are associated with conventional NSAIDs or the non-selective NSAIDs like naproxen, ibuprofen, indomethacin, chenalbutazone, and th yeah, there is no study comparing these NSAIDs to show that one is superior to the other, but they produce GI intolerance in up to 25% of patients who take it, and this can be dyspepsia, nausea, or abdominal pain. You can have asymptomatic small ulcers in the gut if you do endoscopy in all these patients. You can have symptomatic ulcers that either give pain or bleeding, and also complications such as bleeding, perforation, as well as blockage of the uh, outlet of the stomach through which food passes through can occur due to scarring of these ulcers that occur. Yeah. If you look at mortality from these anti-inflammatory medicines that are not selective, which means you're excluding Celebrex from the group, up to 16,000 patients annually die from complications, which is the bleeding and perforation. The NSAIDs are a significant contributor to the cause of death in these 16,000 patients. And you can see it is much more common than some other illnesses that we think are very serious such as cervical cancer or Hodgkin's disease. So what are some strategies that we can use to prevent NSAID-induced GI injury? Well, you can use the COX-2 specific in inhibitor, and that, that is the group that Celebrex and the previously available medication called Vioxx. Uh, we can do, use the lowest effective dose of an NSAID. We can use some additional therapy and basically that is uh, adding misoprostol. And misoprostol is, a, is an agent that coats the stomach and prevents NSAID-induced injury to the stomach. You can use things like a proton pump inhibitor, inhibitor such as Prilosec or Prevacid, or uh, an H2 receptor antagonist, such as Zantac or Tagamet, along with the conventional NSAID like ibuprofen and naproxen, and get some protection. You also want to avoid using blood thinners such as aspirin or Coumadin because you would be more likely to have bleeding if you use that with the NSAID. And you do not want to take prednisone with the NSAID because that also increases the risk of ulceration. When you look at the cumulative um, uh, ulcer uh, presentation with using NSAIDs such as, um, such as uh, ibuprofen and compare it with rofecoxib, which is why it's no longer on the market. If you do endoscopies on all these patients who are either on placebo or one of these NSAIDs, you will see that the ibuprofen patients in the gray, gray have a much higher incidence of asymptomatic ulcers uh, up to half the patients have it at 24 weeks, compared to a very low incidence of these asymptomatic ulcers in a COX-2 selective agent such as rofecoxib. When you look at ulcer complications, when we compare conventional NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen and naproxen, the celecoxib or celebrex used in very high doses, complications of ulcers are also much less, and these are um, symptomatic ulcers that we're talking about that either bleed, have a lot of pain, or cause a gastric outlet um, obstruction, or have a perforation or a hole develop in the stomach. But 
you know, there's always uh, some side effect that we have to worry about. Whenever a drug is very good, we have to always look carefully to see if there's anything bad that can ha happen. The COX-2 inhibitors were studied to see if there were cardiovascular side effects because there was a concern that they might block um, a substance that is in the blood vessel wall that prevents platelets or cells that promote clot formation in the body from sticking together. So taking away that protective substance called prostacycline, the investigators were worried that that would predispose to clot formation and uh, heart attacks or stroke. So in this study where Celebrex was compared with traditional NSAID, they did not find an increased incidence of myocardial infarction or heart attacks or CVAs or strokes in the celecoxib group. Um, and they compared patients who were on aspirin and they compared patients who did not take aspirin. They did not see a, a significant change. On the other hand, in this trial called the RIGOR trial, where rofacoxib or Vioxx was compared with naproxen, there was a statistically significant increased risk of heart attacks in patients with rofacoxib. The signal was ignored till subsequent studies duplicated the increased risk of heart attacks and strokes. And this led to some uh, investigation to find out what the reason was that these uh, drugs uh, caused the side effect. It was it indeed the inhibition of the the uh, substance in the blood vessel wall, or was it something else? So if you look at conventional NSAIDs like naproxen and ibuprofen and pyroxicam and et cetera, when we look at whether these drugs cause hypertension, we see that the blood pressure elevates in, by about 46 millimeters in patients who are treated with these conventional NSAIDs. People who have normal blood pressure are not influenced a lot. The greatest effect appeared to be seen with people who have high blood pressure and who are treated with uh, ACE inhibitors or um, a group of blood pressure essence uh, comprised of lisinopril, benazepril, you know, there are a number of ACE inhibitors available, or beta blockers or vasodilators when they're used to treat high blood pressure. And this seems to block their effect. And this increase in blood pressure, even though it seems very small, epidemiological studies have shown that even minimal increases in blood pressure of 3 to 5 millimeters can sometimes be enough to trigger off a cardiovascular adverse event. This is a six-week trial in high, patients with high blood pressure comparing celecoxib or celebrex with Vioxx, and it shows that patients with Vioxx have a higher incidence of edema or swelling of the leg. This may be because Vioxx has a longer half-life, meaning it lasts in the body for a longer period of time, and this leads to a Vioxx dose given on one day overlapping with the effect of the Vioxx dose on the next day, so a kind of a continuous effect on the kidney retaining salt and water resulting in swelling. And as you might expect, the uh, retention of salt and water results in a much higher change from baseline of blood pressure in the rofacoxib or Vioxx group compared to Celebrex. Celebrex does have a shorter half-life, and the blood pressure, um, the effects of the drug do not overlap from one day to the next unless you take it twice a day. This may have resulted in the uh, side effects of Vioxx uh, causing heart attacks and stroke that ultimately led Vioxx to be taken off the market. So whether you're using a conventional NSAID, such as ibuprofen or naproxen, or a COX-2 specific inhibitor, such as Celebrex, which is still available, we have to be cautious in patients who have heart disease, pre-existing renal impairment, liver disease, or advanced age basically over the age of 75. You want to avoid using it in people who have kidney disease, basically a serum creatinine, which is a measure of kidney function, if it is 2.5 or more. You want to um, monitor very closely in patients who are elderly, who have high blood pressure, 
You want to monitor people for swelling in the leg and elevation of blood pressure and uh, stop using the drug if the blood pressure goes up. And it's probably best to avoid the drug altogether if these patients have pre-existing heart disease. In general, younger patients with ankylosing spondylitis or associated illnesses do well with NSAIDs without any complications. And particularly, short-term treatment for a few weeks when you have a flare is very safe in young patients with uh, um, ankylosing spondylitis and related illness. The one contraindication, as I mentioned earlier, should be that people with colitis, which is uh, inflammation of the colon, such as Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease, should not take NSAIDs. What about some of the other therapies in uh, AS? Well, corticosteroids or steroid injections can help temporarily with treating peripheral arthritis in a joint or in the in treating uh, tendon site uh, attachments which can get inflamed, also called enthesitis. And these can occur in the, uh, in the back, and we have a figure that will show you some of the common sites where enthesitis occurs. There are some over-the-counter herbal products that uh, have been used. They are not as potent as the NSAIDs in uh, efficacy. An uh, example of one of them is white willow bark. What one should realize is that these substances often contain salicylic acid or different kinds of salicylates, which is basically a type of aspirin. And um, a lot of the efficacy from these drugs come from the aspirin content in it. But one should also realize there's probably another 100 compounds in it because this is not purified and selected to have only one active ingredient. And often it's very difficult to know what is effective in it. Acupuncture, massage therapy, and spa therapy are uh, uh, used uh, to treat AS and related illnesses. Spa therapy is particularly more uh, popular in uh, Europe where the uh, treatment is reimbursable. Physical therapy, Tai Chi, and stretching exercises should uh, be practiced by all patients, whether they are on um, in a TNF inhibitor or other kind of therapy, it's very important to uh, keep your posture upright so that even if you were to fuse, you would fuse in an upright position rather than a bent over position, which is what we want to avoid. Opiates can be used to treat patients with ankylosing spondylitis who have an ina inadequate response to treatment using an anti-inflammatory or another disease-modifying substance. There, there are patients who have end-stage joint disease or severe changes in their spine that uh, can get relief by using a opiate such as a fentanyl patch. These are potent drugs and should be used in caution. Um, there is some concern about rebound that can occur, particularly after using steroids in, uh, to treat these conditions. Oral steroids have not been very effective in uh, these illnesses, and if oral steroids are used, it psoriasis on the skin may respond a lot. If you stop the oral steroid, there's often a rebound phenomenon where the psoriasis gets markedly worse. The arthritis does not seem to get markedly better, and hence it doesn't get worse after stopping the steroids either. What about some of the other disease-modifying substance uh, drugs? These drugs are effective primarily in peripheral arthritis in spondyloarthritis. So if you have joint involvement in the hip, in the knees, in the uh, small joints such as the toes or, or the hand, uh, then these drugs can be helpful. Sulfasalazine or azalpidine is effective in controlling peripheral arthritis. Some of the side effects include rashes, liver inflammation, and diarrhea. A reversible decrease in the sperm count can occur, but that will come back up when you stop the drug. Methotrexate is effective in treating peripheral arthritis, low blood count, uh, liver inflammation, and hair loss can be side effects, which can be monitored and uh, uh, effectively managed uh, if you need to use this drug. Thalidomide is a drug that uh, has been off the market for a long time because it caused fetal deformities in women who were taking it during their pregnancy in, in the 1960s. It is available on a compassionate basis. Um, and has been used in clinical trials, 
uh, in patients with AS at uh, 200 milligram a day or, or, or less, it does cause some nerve damage, which can be permanent. It can cause blood clots as well. It's not used very often in AS other than in clinical trials. The flunamide or Areva, a drug that has not been uh, approved in an ankylosing spondylitis, approved for rheumatoid arthritis, has shown some preliminary evidence of efficacy in peripheral arthritis. Side effects include liver inflammation, diarrhea, nerve damage can occur. It's a rare side effect, but it's uh, not reversible. What about pomidronate? This is an intravenous treatment for ankylosing spondylitis. 84 uh, AS patients were given pomidronate either at an effective dose of 60 milligram or a placebo dose of 10 milligram every month for six months. They looked at 50% decrease in the disease activity index, and they found that 40% of the 60 milligram group achieved this 50% uh, decrease. There was no change in the inflammatory markers, but there was uh, improvement of pain. Occasional bone pain can occur as a side effect of this. When they did MRI for the lumbar spine before and after, it showed a decrease in the edema. It is not an approved medication for AS, but it may be effective uh, when other treatments fail. What about the tumor necrosis factor antagonists? Uh, there are four agents that are approved for ankylosing spondylitis, and uh, I will mention their names and go over unique characteristics as we go through these slides. Adalimumab or Humira is one of them. Etanacept and, or Enbrel is the other one. Infliximab or Renicade is the third one. We'll talk about the fourth one that's approved in a little bit. This slide uh, looks at psoriatic arthritis and how effective tumor necrosis factor blocking drugs are in psoriatic arthritis, both on the joints, measured by these ACR 20, 50, and 70 um, uh, outcome measures, which look at joint count reduction similar to the AFAS-20. These, uh, they are, these uh, outcome measures are used for peripheral arthritis. The AFAS-20, 40, and 70 are used for the spine improvement that occurs with spondylitis. PASI refers to the skin. Uh, it's a psoriasis improvement index. And as you can see, the infliximab and adalimumab, which are monoclonal antibodies or antibodies that are made to block tumor necrosis factor perform perform better in uh, in uh, treating psoriasis in uh, patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis the etanacept, which is a receptor protein that is um, uh, basically uh, put together to mop up the tumor necrosis factor, works for psoriasis, but generally has to be used in higher doses. The 25 milligram twice a week does not work as well as the monoclonal antibodies. So here, here's an in instance where the monoclonal antibodies are probably preferable when the patient with ankylosing spondylitis has psoriasis as well, because it will treat the psoriasis better than the etanacept. When you look at x-rays, the etanacept uh, performs just as well as the monoclonal antibodies. So the arthritis and the radiological damage or erosions that occur are treated just as well with etanacept compared to the Humira or the uh, Remicade. When you look at enthesitis, the, all three drugs work very well for it. The uh, enthesitis refers to the inflammation of tender, uh, tendon attachment sites. Common areas include the heel, the back of the uh, hip bone, the sacroiliac joints, the uh, sternal uh, costal joints where the clavicle or collarbone attaches to the breastbone or sternum the uh, areas where the ribs attach to the uh, sternum or breastbone as well are areas where you can get inflammation. And as you can see, in this case, Humira, used as an example, is much better than placebo in decreasing the number of sites that are inflamed, Humira in the yellow and the placebo in the black. These uh, drugs also have 
sustained um, uh, efficacy. Here is a slide looking at uh, Enbrel used for 72 weeks, and as you can see, there is uh, a sustained improvement in Enbrel used by closing spondylitis going all the way to 96 weeks in this slide. So Enbrel is a drug with uh, a very short half-life, meaning that within four days, half the drug is gone. There are some advantages to that. If you have a patient that's at higher risk for infection, perhaps Enbrel would be a better drug to use since if you stop it, the medication will disappear from the blood a little bit faster than the other drugs. And we'll talk about their half-lives in a, in, a, in a moment. Here's a uh, x-ray, I'm sorry, an MRI of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis treated with infliximab or Remicade. And you can see that certain areas of the spine that are inflamed where there's fluid or edema uh, characterized by increased water in, on, in the corners of the vertebra improves dramatically after treatment with infliximab. Infliximab has a longer half-life than Enbrel. It has a half-life of approximately 10 to 12 days, which makes dosing of the infliximab um, much less frequent than the Enbrel, but it also leads to the drug persisting in the body and, and increased uh, concern when a person has an infection and you have to stop the drug and wait for the drug to clear. This is a, an agent that has not received approval for ankylosing spondylitis yet. This is a trial in rheumatoid arthritis. This is a drug by the name of sertrolizumab or Simsia, which is approved for rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease. It shows uh, great efficacy in Crohn's disease and uh, rheumatoid arthritis and will probably get approval for AS very soon as well. It is different in that the molecule, which is an antibody in structure, has a supporting backbone that is made from a compound called polyethylene glycol, or PEG. It's pegylated. This results in the um, drug uh, not being degraded in the body as quickly and leads to a longer half-life. So you can dose this drug intravenously once a month and uh, get benefit, whereas the Enbrel needs to be dosed every week in order to get uh, a benefit. Golimumab is the fourth drug that was recently approved for ankylosing spondylitis. It uh, shows that it is um, very effective for the treatment of AS, in, uh, and it achieves ASAS 40 scores of uh, 54.3 in 100 milligram dose. It is also a long-acting compound and can be given every four weeks. The uh, approved dose is a 50 milligram dose. And as you can see, the 50 milligram given every four weeks gives you an ASAS uh, 40 score of 43.5, which is the score we look at. This is also a long-acting compound, and uh, it is uh, effective in uh, treating ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and also has received approval in rheumatoid arthritis as well. The uh, trade name of this drug is Symphony. When you look at treatment with, uh, for ankylosing spondylitis and you look at the uh, duration of disease, you can see that a larger percentage of patients who have earlier onset disease, less than 10 years, respond better. These patients get a 50% reduction in their disease activity score index compared to patients who have had the illness for more than 20 years. So you can see a smaller percentage of those patients achieve this endpoint of 50% reduction. But even if you have complete fusion of the spine, these agents can help reduce the pain and uh, stiffness. You can switch from one drug to another and get efficacy, but here a study showing adalimumab or Humira um, being added on to AS patients after patients have failed treatment with either Enbrel or infliximab. You can see the response rates are a little bit lower than when you have not used Etanercept or infliximab before 
basically an ASS 40 score of 46 if you're switching from one drug to another, whereas if you're using the drug uh, initially, you get a 67% ASS 40 score. It, j it just shows that once you fail one TNF agent, you are less likely to have a very, very favorable uh, response rate, uh, but there is that you can still switch and get a positive response if you fail one drug. Do spinal, do TNF blockers block spinal bone fusion? This is a difficult question to answer because the changes of bone fusion occur at a very gradual rate. You need to have a group of AS patients on active treatment with a TNF blocker for two years and have another group of matched AS patients on a placebo for two years in order to really definitively answer this question. But this trial will not be approved because of ethical reasons. So people have tried to get around it by looking at treated patients with ankylosing spondylitis with one of the TNF blockers, whether it's infliximab or, or uh, Enbrel. They have looked at treatment groups and compared it with a historical co cohort called GESTIC, patients basically that have been followed for a long period of time before TNF blockers were available. And they tried to select patients that could be matched with the patients with active treatment with the TNF blocker. And when they compared both the groups, they found that there was no change in the amount of uh, bone fusion in the first group which was treated with either infliximab uh, and in, an, in another studies with Enbro compared to this historical cohort. This is not a perfect study, but this is the best we can do at the moment. Uh, I've had personal experience with patients who have been on TNF blockers, and basically when patients pres present with changes of spinal fusion, spinal fusion does continue to occur, but patients fuse in a much more better upright posture which may be not possible if you don't have these drugs and patients are in a lot of pain. Therefore, I think that even though we have no evidence to show that it prevents spinal bone fusion, uh, there is possibly an advantage in having less pain and being able to stand more upright and the fusion occur in a more direct posture rather than a bent posture, which, is, which makes a person much uh, more prone to fall. When you look at uveitis, which is inflammation of the colored part of the eye, about 25% of AS stations have this problem. The monoclonal antibody, which is infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, or symphony, appears to have better efficacy than etanercept, which has less efficacy. It is possible that if you increase the dose of etanercept to a higher dose, that you will have less flares of uveitis, but at the moment, with the approved dose that we have, the monoclonal antibodies may be better for a patient who has frequent uveitis flares as well as spondylitis. When you look at psoriasis, rash, skin, and nail changes, which can be seen in 10 to 20 percent of patients with ankylosing spondylitis. On the other hand, patients with psoriasis um, and arthritis, about uh, 25 percent of them could have spondylitis uh, that coexists with it. There is a score called a PASI score that has been developed to see how well the, um, the drugs improve psoriasis. They have uh, areas of the body mapped out. They multiply the area of involvement in each part of the body by an involvement score. And then they multiply that by a severity score depending on how red the rash is, how raised the rash is, and how thick it is. And as you can see, this PASI score improved by 50% here in this picture, 75% in this picture, and a 90% improvement in this picture after the use of TNF drugs. And when you look at the different drugs that are used to treat it, you can see that etanercept or Enbro needs to be used in a higher dose of 50 milligrams twice a week to be comparable with the monoclonal antibodies, Humira or Infliximab. So, Again, here is a situation where the infliximab or adalimumab, Humira or, or Remicade outperform etanercept a little bit when you have coexisting psoriasis. What about health-related uh, consequences? Well, if you don't treat AS with these drugs, then the costs are astronomically high compared to 
treated patients who are on a TNF inhibitor. This makes the case to use this drug in these, in these patients. When you look at uh, cardiovascular events, basically all patients with inflammation, whether they have rheumatoid arthritis or AS, are at increased risk for cardiovascular events, basically heart attacks and stroke. When you look at all cause mortality, mortality from all the causes and cardiovascular events, use of TNF inhibitors has shown to decrease the amount of mortality or deaths related to these illnesses. So that is also an argument to use. But what about safety? When you look at the safety considerations, what we have to keep into account is serious infections do occur in TNF blockers. And you have to monitor patients very carefully. You have to discontinue the TNF inhibitor if you have an infection. Opportunistic infections can occur. These are rare, fortunately. Tuberculosis can reactivate if one has been exposed to TB in the past. So it's very important for t patients who are going to start a tumor necrosis factor blocker to have a tuberculin skin test prior to uh, the use of this uh, drug. Some people argue that the skin test should be repeated on a yearly basis. With respect to cancer, there's always been a lot of scrutiny. Um, patients with rheumatoid arthritis and AS patients are at increased risk of lymphoma because these are inflammatory illnesses. There, there have been some recent uh, studies that have shown rare lymphomas that uh, are occurring in children receiving TNF antagonists. These seem to occur at the uh, approximately 30 uh, uh, month uh, interval after starting the, the drug, so they kind of occur earlier than later. And this is probably a pattern that uh, uh, we will uh, go over again uh, as we go through this uh, potential side effect. There's been a black box warning added because of these rare lymphomas that are being seen in children. In adults, we have not seen the increase as much. Other safety considerations with uh, respect to Remicade, which has a mouse protein in it, Repeated infusions of uh, Remicade can result in infusion reactions, which are not fatal, but are very uncomfortable with shortness of breath and uh, uh, sometimes rashes that occur. Live vaccines are contraindicated when you are on a TNF inhibitor. If you need to use a vaccine, such as a shingles vaccine or a yellow fever vaccine, you need to be off these drugs for at least eight weeks before you use the drug so that the immune system is not suppressed. Otherwise, you can get an active illness, whether it's with a measles, mumps, rubella, chickenpox vaccine, or a flu vaccine that has a live virus in it, which is a vaccine given uh, intranasally into the nose. Demyelinating illnesses are contraindications to TNF blockers. So if somebody has demyelination on MRI of the brain or has had a seizure before or has had Guillain-Barre before, it sh uh, these agents should not be used. There have been rare instances of demyelinating illnesses occurring, but uh, largely we don't think this is a problem in patients who do not have a pre-existing pre uh, problem with these illnesses. Rarely blood counts can go down, which has not been a frequent problem. People who have advanced heart failure should not be using this drug. Um, infliction of remicade is contraindicated in advanced CHF. You can get a lupus-like syndrome, basically a condition where you get arthritis and, and uh, rashes, and also new onset psoriasis, paradoxically, can occur in patients who have taken TNF inhibitors for a long time. So that's something to monitor. Sometimes when you stop the drug, usually when you stop the drug, the side effect goes, goes away. If you switch, for instance, Enbro to Remicade, uh, and a person has had psoriasis occur on the, on the embryo treatment, the uh, psoriasis does go away. So it, it often responds to a change in treatment. So what are the risk factors? This is in rheumatoid arthritis, but this applies to uh, people with AS as well. If you have a patient with diabetes and lung disease and you're putting the patient on a TNF blocker, the, the risk is going to be higher for an infection. So any of these things will predispose you to an infection. When you look at the relative risk for infection in this health organization and they looked at it, they found an elevated risk of uh, infection, 1.9 compared to people on methotrexate. 
And so, in, a, in other words, if you treated 143 patients with a tumor necrosis factor blocker, one person would get an infection. Uh, in a third of patients, it was pneumonia. The, the infection seemed to cluster and occur earlier during therapy. People who are on established therapy were not at risk. Perhaps selecting people were more prone to get the infection due to this drug. When you look at the risk of hospitalization, if uh, in the Swedish database they found that there was an increase of 30% in hospitalizations in patients receiving TNF blockers, there was no increase in mortality, the risk for hospitalization decreased with the duration of treatment. So the longer people were on it, less patients were hospitalized. When you look at uh, planned surgery, it is a good idea to stop the TNF inhibitor at least four weeks prior to surgery. There appears to be a reduced risk of post-operative infections when patients are off TNF inhibitors at least 28 days or four weeks. So this is a, a practice that we all follow. TB has been a problem, and as you can see, when you put in TB screening, there is a reduction in the occurrence of TB. Basically, one out of 100 patients were treated for a whole year gets TB if you do not screen, and this is in Europe, and the rates can be cut down to a third of that, and even less in North America when TB screening with a skin test is employed. Opportunistic infections are very rare. This is a list of atypical fungal infections and um, protozoal infections that can occur in uh, patients who are treated with uh, these TNF blocking drugs. The rates are approximately, you know, for pneumocystis, for example, seven patients, if 10,000 patients are treated for one year. So they are very rare, but they do occur, and there should be heightened surveillance for any symptoms that occur suggestive of an illness, such as fever, cough, etc. What about the risk of malignancy? When you look at the risk of malignancy, there does not seem to be an increased risk of solid tumors like breast, colon, lung, etc. There is some evidence that there's an increased risk of skin cancers, particularly non-melanoma skin cancers such as basal cell or squamous cell. And this has been found in other uh, databases of uh, uh, patients treated with TNF blockers. Non-melanoma skin cancer appears to be increased, but as you follow these patients over time, the number of cancers appears to go down, even in the skin cancer group. You can see an elevation in patients who are treated for less than a year, but again, as you follow them uh, over three years, it, it appears to decrease. So the thinking is that these agents do not cause malignancy, but it may block one of the defense mechanisms that the body has to, to keep these malignancies from appearing. So there are malignancies that are destined to appear, maybe a year later or three years later or five years later, and the TNF inhibitors may unmask them. So an increased surveillance for any kind of skin problem should be maintained in the first year or two years after starting these therapies. Um, there have been trials of TNF inhibitors in other patients, high-risk patients who are smokers who had emphysema or chronic obstructive lung disease were treated with infliximab, and we saw the same pattern. Nine patients treated with infliximab had malignancies in the first year of treatment. When we treat another condition, basically a condition with vasculitis called Wegner's, when they were given Embro, we saw that the patients treated with Embro had an increased risk of uh, solid tumors that occurred within the first year of treatment that was not seen. So basically, unmasking of malignancy seemed to occur early on when you treat it. The rates are not very high, but they do seem to occur. And as I mentioned earlier, lymphoma and leukemia rarely be seen in children. Um, we need to have uh, uh, more uh, analysis and follow-up of these individuals to see who might be at higher risk for um, these uh, problems. When you look at previous cancer and the risk of recurrent cancer when you use the TNF blocker, it appears that solid tumors like breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, there's no increased risk of recurrence whether you use methotrexate or a TNF blocker. There is a risk of recurrent cancer that is elevated when you use a TNF blocker, 
um, with respect to leukemias and lymphoma. So patients who have lymphomas and leukemias should be monitored more closely and uh, the risk versus benefit analysis need to employ before you put a patient who has had a prior lymphoma and leukemia on a TNF antagonist. What is the future direction of spinal arthritis research? Well, with respect to treatment of these agents, we need to improve our understanding of the risk of infectious and neoplastic risk. We need to have an increase in our therapeutic armamentarium to control the illness. We also need to uh, do more research into causes of fusion of the spine and the joint and have better agents that can prevent this from happening. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Halegwa. Um, do you want to turn it back over to me now? In terms sure. of, okay. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to open up questions. So you should see um, the questions box pop up. We're still having a little bit of the problem with the interference. We can hear one person. We can't quite figure out why. So we've been on the phone with the um, company. So. I apologize for that if that's distracting. Um, so uh, let's kick it off with some questions. Dr. Halegua, for those of us no longer helped by the various TNF blockers or DMARDs like sulfazalazine and methotrexate, what other options are there for us? Um, well, it is a, a tough uh, situation not to have some of the approved drugs not work for you. I covered some drugs that are available um, that are not approved for AS. One of them would be the intravenous pomidronate given monthly at a dose of 60 milligrams uh, intravenously. That has been shown to be effective. Thalidomide is an op another option that's available. There are certain other uh, treatments that are approved for rheumatoid arthritis that are available. One of them is abatacept or um, Orencia, which is in clinical trials for AS and should be promising. Uh, just recently, another agent has been approved for rheumatoid arthritis about two weeks ago, ago a drug called Actemra, uh, which is an interleukin-6 blocker, which uh, will be promising in ankylosing spondylitis as well. And, you know, furthermore, it's important to understand that um, Sometimes switching to a drug that you used earlier, which was effective earlier, but it was no longer effective over a period of time, may give you a, uh, some response and improvement while you're, you know, waiting for your doctor to get one of the other drugs that I just mentioned uh, approved for your condition. Okay. Is there a danger to taking Humira or one of the other TNFs if it's gone bad? Um, this person is apparently a traveler and is, um, she thinks they're okay with the ice packs and whatnot, but um, she's just, sometimes she's taken it, and so she's, should she be concerned? Um, I, I think there should be more concern about it not being efficacious than, you know, something really, really bad happened. But I have had patients who have left their um, drugs that have been delivered by, by mail um, on the doorstep for, you know, more than 12 hours or 18 hours. And then they have used it, and I've had a few patients who have had side effects, including skin reactions, and uh, one patient had uh, some vomiting with it as well. So, you know, again, one should not use it if it is being left out for a considerable amount of time more than three or four hours um, at room temperature, but, you know, I would be more concerned about loss of efficacy than any serious side effect. Okay. What meds, uh, medications do you suggest for sleeping problems due to pain? Well, I, I think, you know, the best uh, treatment would be to direct an agent or use an agent that uh, reduces the pain. So. If you have not tried an NSAID, um, then try the NSAID to reduce the pain at night so you can sleep. If you cannot tolerate it or it's not effective, then use another agent, whether it's a TNF inhibitor or otherwise. 
if you use only a sleep medication and you have pain, chances are that you will need, you know, very high dose of a sleep medicine to help you to sleep if it's inflammation that is causing you to not sleep and uh, then a sleep agent would not be very effective. Okay. Um, my husband read something about a new drug from sea urchins. Is there – do you want to speak to that? Another um, – you know, I've heard the sea urchin claim before. I don't know enough about this claim, so I will have to leave that question um, to somebody else who has more knowledge about it. Okay. Um, why is there such a debate over whether methotrexate should be taken for AS, either alone or along with a TNF blocker? Um, for those of us who are on a TNF blocker alone, and it's no longer helping, is it worth it to try again with the methotrexate? Um, the, 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 there is some evidence that antibodies do form against the medications used to treat AS, uh, and that these antibodies will block the TNF inhibitor and decrease the efficacy of uh, the uh, drugs over time. For instance, with Remicade, there is uh, a mouse protein to which antibodies form, and it has been shown in trials that when you use methotrexate along with Remicade, you can decrease the amount of antibodies made against the mouse protein and increase the duration of time that Remicade will be effective. Now, there may be antibodies that are formed against Enbrel and Humira and Symphony and the other drugs as well that may decrease the efficacy of these drugs over time that we are not able to measure. There, there has been no trial that has, been, that has shown that that has employed methotrexate with these drugs in ankylosing spondylitis and the related illness. Um, that has shown that there will be um, efficacy of these drugs for a long period of time. That said, there is certainly a lot of evidence that if you add methotrexate to Embryo or Humira and the person has either psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis in the small joints, there's an increase in efficacy when you combine methotrexate with these drugs when you have these peripheral manifestations. But as far as the spine goes, methotrexate has no effect on it, but it may help to decrease antibodies to um, these uh, drugs that are used that are effective against spinal inflammation. Okay. Is there any known link between uh, Humira or any of the other TNFs and kidney stones? I'm not aware of any link between the TNF inhibitors and kidney stones. However, increase in infection from a kidney stone could be possible when you're taking these drugs. Okay. Do any of the medications have uh, psychiatric side effects, or do they disturb the mood at all? Well, a common thing I've seen when I've used these medications in the treatment of autoimmune illnesses is that it uplifts the mood. And, you know, I don't know whether that is from the drug or it's the fact that the cytokines, such as a TNF blocker, has a, a markedly inhibitory effect on the mood. So by blocking the cytokine, there's a mood improvement that occurs in, uh, in these conditions. Okay. What more can be done to combat this extreme fatigue that I experience? Well, you know, the, the fatigue uh, that occurs with AS may be due to inflammation, in which case the medications that combat inflammation work very well. The, the fatigue that does not respond to treatment of inflammation needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis to see whether it comes from disturbed sleep, um, uh, poor sleep patterns, uh, sleep that is non-restorative, meaning you don't get enough deep sleep to wake up feeling refreshed during the morning, some people have a neurocardiogenic cause for it where their blood pressure is run very low and therefore they are fatigued. 
Other people may have a coexisting mood disorder, such as depression, that could cause fatigue. So each person needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case basis to evaluate what is the cause of their fatigue and what can be done to improve it. Okay. Um, can a patient taking one of the TNFs build up an immunity to the drug if he or she decides to go off it for a period of time and then go back on it again? Um, I have seen this happen in patients with AS and related illnesses. You could have a patient who is uh, doing great on a particular drug, such as Humira perhaps, and then they go off of it for a length of time, three months or six months because of an operation or an infection that needed to have prolonged treatment, and then they go back on it, and the psoriasis, the arthritis, or the spinal pain does not respond as well. I don't think anybody understands exactly what happens with uh, these cases, but the feeling is that perhaps um, when you go off the medication, you uh, allow the immune system to become more active, and the increased activity of the immune system basically allows the immune system to make antibodies to any remnants of the drug, and the part of the immune system that is making the antibodies to the remnants of the drug or the memory of the drug is fully active when you restart the drug again and therefore the drug is not as efficacious as before. Okay. Regarding the NSAID GI complications, are there tests or symptoms my doctor and I can look for to prevent problems? I'm sorry, would you repeat that question? Sure. Regarding the NSAID uh, GI complications, are there tests or symptoms my doctor and I can look for to prevent the problems? Um, the common symptoms that you and your doctor need to look out for include um, stomach pain, either um, symptoms of heartburn, where you have a sensation of burning the chest, or you wake up at night, the sensation of acid uh, coming up to your mouth. Um, you can also see symptoms of uh, bloating, uh, stomach distension, diarrhea can be a, a side effect. Um, of course, blood in the stool is a very serious um, symptom that needs to be monitored for. Change in color of the stools can all. Dr. Oh, okay. um, as a monitor, monitoring uh, function. Okay. Uh, those are the, some of the symptoms I think that should be watched for. Okay. We're almost at our time that's up, but um, do you have time to take a few more questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, what herbal supplements, vitamins, if any, can be used to help overall health with AS, such as calcium supplements, vitamin C, et cetera? Um, the uh, osteoporosis that occurs due to bone loss is something that can be um, improved by taking calcium and vitamin D. If you do have osteoporosis, then uh, calcium supplementation in a dose of about 1,500 milligrams a day in divided doses can be uh, helpful. Vitamin D uh, is generally used in a dose of uh, 800 units or higher, depending on blood levels, to prevent bone loss as well. In terms of other agents, I think taking a multivitamin every day has been shown in certain patient subgroups to help to prevent infections as well as the other herbal therapies that are available to combat inflammation. I think that they are generally weak, but a person with mild uh, spinal arthritis could consider using some of the agents that were mentioned, which are clearly off-label and, you know, also can cause side effects and need to be monitored by a doctor. Okay. Are there variations in the effectiveness of TNF medications between different manufacturing batches? Sometimes it seems I get more response from the drug than I do at other times, and I'm wondering if this is due to differences between batches. Um, I would not be able to tell you that there's no difference between the batches. I 
believe that there's a very stringent uh, monitoring process going on by independent agencies, um, uh, including the FDA, where they study these drugs periodically to make sure that they are similar, you know, in terms of efficacy and that they are pure without any contamination. Um, the reason why drugs don't seem to be effective at one time during the year compared to another may be due to the fact that the illness is more active during one time of the year than the other and that the agents do not suppress the illness completely. Um, but, you know, again, that is uh, speculation on my part. Okay. Can AS or, a or the AS treatments cause slight tremor, for example, in the hands or small involuntary twitches? And if so, what can be done for this? Um, I think the tremor that or twitches that the person is referring to are myoclonic uh, jerks or also known as myoclonic seizures, even though this is not like a generalized seizure that, you know, people often think about. These are localized problems within the muscles that occur due to the development of what are called top bands within the muscle. And these top bands can relax at certain times, particularly at nighttime when one is uh, relaxing or attempting to go to sleep, and you get this twitch or a jerk in a part of the body, whether it's the hand, the shoulder, or the back or lower extremity. There are medications that inhibit the uh, motor nerves in the spinal cord, uh, benzodiazepines, and other medications commonly used to treat seizure manifestations, often used off-label for these um, uh, the manifestations that can be used. To my knowledge, they are not related uh, to the treatments for AS, whether they are TNF inhibitors or NSAIDs, and uh, they are uh, not uh, isolated to this group of illness either. So any connected tissue disease or other uh, illness, um, people who are healthy also can get these uh, twitches. Okay. Is it safe to take other meds while on early treatment of TNF inhibitors if effective relief hasn't been achieved yet? Uh, it is safe to combine TNF inhibitors with uh, anti-inflammatory medications or one of the other drugs I mentioned, such as methotrexate or sulfasalazine, if they are giving you some efficacy. The only things that should not be com combined would be one biologic combined with another. So one should not combine Humira and Enbro together or the TNF inhibitor with another agent, such as an interleukin receptor antagonist, such as Kinneret. The, the combinations of these biologics together gives you an unacceptable, unacceptable risk for uh, infection that uh, is not worthwhile, you know, taking um, into uh, risk here. Okay. Do any of the drugs you discussed cause hormonal changes? I speak particularly of testosterone and thyroid. Mm, I, I don't think it is known for a fact that they uh, don't do it. But the clinical trials that have been done, which last for anywhere from six months to a year, have not shown any change in the hormonal levels, including uh, thyroid or um, other hormones, including testosterone. Okay. Is there any evidence that any of these drugs cause weight gain? Um, there is some evidence that uh, certain TNF inhibitors can cause an increase in weight, and I've observed it in a few patients. Um, TNF as a cytokine in the body leads to a lot of weight loss, including muscle wasting. So some of the weight gain may be a natural weight gain that occurs because you've taken away something that causes weight loss. But I have seen weight gain to the tune of 
you know, 10 to 20 pounds of current from TNF inhibitors, which has uh, resolved after stopping it. But the weight gain is not uh, like the weight gain that might occur with medications like prednisone. Okay. Is making, in making the decision to try a TNF medication, if pain is bearable, should they still be considered just to prevent further joint fusion if the entire thoracic spine is fused? So the question is, should the medication be con continued if there is total fusion of the spine? Um, and if they're dealing with the pain, okay. Should they still consider a TNF? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, the, I think the answer to that is that the patient needs to um, quantify their symptoms, you know, whether it is their stiffness, whether there is some residual pain somewhere or a skin rash or colitis. You know, if there are other manifestations that are not controlled with either lifestyle modification or another medication, then the TNF agent should be used. If you're using it in the hope that it might prevent something, uh, I think that, you know, in that situation, the risk of the side effect on the medication outweighs the benefit. You should always use these drugs if you're, if you're trying to control a manifestation or symptom of the illness that is not uh, manageable by any other modality and is interfering with your quality of life. Okay, and let's do one more question. Um, can you give your thoughts on natural remedies to treat AS? Well, you know, I think about 50% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis have a mild illness with respect to no um, serious risk of um, bone fusion and postural abnormalities and no severe peripheral arthritis that would lead to destruction of a joint, such as a hip joint, requiring a, requiring a hip replacement. If we can identify these patients very reliably, I think it is up to that patient to decide what they want to use for treatment. They could experiment with the diet, you know, that's low in carbohydrates that some people tout as a, an approach to control symptoms. They could take an over-the-counter agent that decreases inflammation, um, like Bosvalia or um, some of the other agents I mentioned, like the yarrow root or something else. Whether they are effective or not, it's left to be seen, but they might provide enough benefit to um, treat the symptoms of the illness. And if you're not, you know, prone to serious manifestations, then that may be all that's required. But if you have a family member or a family history of a, a person who has that AS and has that severe problems with uh, loss of a hip joint or severe bone fusion or other serious manifestations, then I think that person should not try these over-the-counter remedies or dietary uh, modalities and should concentrate on the approved and uh, scientific, scientifically approved uh, medicines and methods to treat the illness in order to reduce the mor mor morbidity of the illness and to modify the, the symptoms. Thank you, Dr. Holegua, and thank, thank you, you for um, presenting for us today. We really appreciate it. Um, so uh, before we end the webinar, I just want to provide a few reminders for everybody. Um, first of all, uh, if your question did not get answered, um, we you can send your question to me, and uh, we'll do our best to try to answer it. I usually get a ton of questions after this is over with, um, so just bear with me as I try to sort through them all and um, as I try to gather the answers for you. Um, the question should be general in nature, though. Um, we can't answer questions that are specific to your medical situation. Um, Second, please give us your feedback. You can fill out a survey at www.spondylase.org slash survey. Um, 
and you'll be directed to complete a survey in SurveyMonkey. Um, you'll also get an email with the link to that survey in about an hour. Um, and if you missed anything today, we've recorded today's webinar. It's going to be available in the member area of the website later this week. So if you're not a member, please support SAA by becoming a member today. Um, you can find information on how to become a member on our website. Joining SAA gives you access to our member area where you can find the recording of this webinar along with recordings of previous seminars. Um, our magazine, the archive of our magazine, uh, podcasts, so on and so forth. I want to thank you for attending today's webinar. We hope it provided you with valuable information, and we hope that you will join us for the next webinar or seminar in, the, uh, in your area. So thank you. And um, let me just give my email out. It's melissa.velez at spondylitis.org. For those of you, I think most of you should have it because it's related to the invite. So, again, thank you. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and um, uh, we'll hopefully be involved with you again soon. Take care.